Welcome to Books on Point. Three years ago, the book Apartheid, Guns and Money, A Tale of Profit by Henny van Furen was launched. The book is an expose of the machinery created in defense of apartheid, sanctions busting the people and corporations who profited from it. And uh, we're joined on the line via Skype by Henny van Fieren to talk to us about the book. Henny, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, Nastasia. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me on the show. As I mentioned in my intro, the book was launched three years ago. Let's talk about the reception you've received thus far since the book uh, hit the shelves. Yeah, so um, Apartheid Guns and Money was published in 2017, and uh, it happened at quite an extraordinary time. We were talking about the untold and, if you like, often not understood story of uh, economic crime and corruption from the apartheid period that had not been dealt with by the TRC and subsequently by any of our democratic governments. And we had been investigating that for five years. The organization where I work, Open Secrets, launched that book in 2017, and it happened at exactly the same time as the Gupta leaks were made public. And so we had this parallel story, these narratives of uh, the revelations of state capture, the extent of contemporary state capture. And next to that was a really important story that we needed to understand if we need to understand how we ended up in this place that we are today. And that's the narrative of, e of economic crime that took place as part of this crime against humanity, apartheid. Um, the reception, I think, um, was was quite extraordinary in the way in which many South Africans picked up the book. We traveled the length and breadth of the country, um, sharing uh, through talks and, and not only in bookshops, but in libraries and community halls, uh, spoke to hundreds, if not thousands of people. Um, and uh, the, the reception was extraordinary. I think many people felt like it helped them piece together and really important part of our story as, as um, South Africans. Uh, and shone a light on a network that until now had never been held um, to account. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's work that we continue. We continue picking up the pieces from that book uh, of corporations and banks that haven't been held to account and find ways as an organization through Open Secrets to hold them accountable. On that note, then, how easy or difficult was it to be able to, you know, get access to the archives, to the thousands of documents that you were able to go through, and also the assistance from various counterparts in different countries in helping you put the book together? Yeah, Anastasia. So, um, you know, the 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 one of the important things, as you say, was was getting hold of the records of the documents, and we relied on people who we interviewed, but we relied. Uh, on on the hard work of, of of actually digging through archival material, so we worked through uh, close to 25 different archives in in um, seven different countries around the world, um, and of course, the, you know, the, in a way that that's also meant that the book has was received uh, has had an international reception because of the very international nature of this network. It's since been published in the United States and the United Kingdom last year, um, uh, and the 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 process process of, of collecting that material, as you say, wasn't easy. Um, you know, there are cases that we were involved in threatening to take government departments to court to gain access to the material. It took years. And in some instances, I was looking this morning through some notes, It's we've been waiting for seven years to get access to material that was never made uh, public in time time for the publication of apartheid guns and money so you know there's there's uh, there's ongoing work with the south african history archive to hold various government entities including the department of defense to account who are still withholding material that's crucial to understanding our past uh, and so that's why we always argue that the material in apartheid guns and money is only a contribution towards this this narrative that there are still many pockets of secrets that remain and and those are things that we're going to continue you know trying to to shine a light on and and reveal through our work. Speaking of those pockets of secrets, do you find that uh, you know the political elite and institutions have somewhat lost the appetite to want to understand what happened in the past and tackle those economic crimes? Yeah, I certainly think so. I think it's often in the interest, Nastasia. It's a good point of political elites to try and and forget, and they want us to forget. They want us to move on. The idea that you know news cycles are so short. Uh, the idea is that we shouldn't focus on 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 understanding 
the nature of power. And so when we look at the nature of power, it's looking at big corporations in South Africa today, whether it's corporations like, um, and just to use an example, like Naspers or others, they have their roots firmly in, in a history of apartheid in this country. And it's important for us to understand that. It's not because, uh, you know, there's, it, that everything doesn't have to be agenda driven, as some people argue. Understanding our history and understanding people's complicity in crimes is all, also a way for us to be able to better, you know, figure out the world that we live in right now. Um, so there is certainly a pushback against this, and it's a pushback that continues until today. We've seen that around the big arms scandal that Jacob Zuma was involved in, but many big European arms companies like Talis and others, uh, British Aerospace, there's an idea that we should just let those matters go, the politicians and corporations argue. And we see it again right now with the big scandals of state capture. Some people argue, let it go. It's three, four, five years ago. And it's precisely this kind of tenacity we need from civil society and from ordinary people. And, and maybe just to say, Anastasia, one of the things that was extraordinary for us um, in, in taking the book around, in speaking again with community groups, um, with different folks, was the extraordinary interest. Um, I think, I, I guess at this point, over 20,000 books were sold. But what we're happiest with is that the books were available in libraries. I've had so many people contact me who are engaging with the content. And so while the political elite may not be interested in, in understanding the big narrative and holding those people to account, what we find are that ordinary folks, ordinary South Africans are deeply invested in understanding our past and understanding the nature of power and that which determines our futures. Is there one case study that you could share with us that could help the viewers understand the nature of some of the networks that um, are mentioned in the book? Yeah, so it's a, it's it's a, it's almost 600 pages long, and um, uh, you know it's it's packed with material and and um, and a, a number of uh, really helpful infographics um, as well. Uh, but I think that of the, the the many stories that are worth recounting, let me use one example, if if I may, and there are a number. Um, we focused on the big banks that were involved in laundering funds for the apartheid regime, but um, most important one. One of the important facts, facts that we, we uncovered was that uh, in Paris throughout the 1980s, there was a, a secret office within the South African embassy, an entire floor on the embassy of the embassy in Paris uh, that was occupied by arms corps officials. So the state-owned arms company were busting sanctions and they were working what we were able to show through intelligence documents that were declassified hand in glove with the very top French elite. So they were speaking to French uh, presidents and prime ministers uh, uh, clandestinely amongst others. Um, those companies were not only busting sanctions and the French government was, but what we were able to piece and trail together, of course, is that it's often exactly the same companies that were involved in crimes after apartheid. Talis, which stands in the dock today with Jacob Zuma accused of bribery of an attempt to both buy our country in the same way that Jacob Zuma is accused of trying to sell the country off to a French arms company, was the same company that was involved in criminal behavior in South Africa, allegedly in the 1980s. And so, you know, I think what's really important, again, are the continuities. Um, if it wasn't for the arms deal of the late 19. 90s, we probably wouldn't have seen a weakened NPA and a National Prosecuting Authority and, of course, the state capture that's happened. And so, so this past not only matters, but it's helped to determine the present we find ourselves in as a country. And I think um, that, for, you know, for me and colleagues, was, was extraordinary to see that piece together. Henny, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. That is Henny van Fieren, who is the author of the book titled Apartheid, Guns and Money. That's a wrap from us. Uh, we have more news with you after the break and we have your weather details as well. Goodbye.